what is the DSMB's authority? The DSMB can request to see all blinded and unblinded data, can request reports, and can advise the institute to start, stop, or modify a trial protocol. In the next slide, you can see the difference between the open and closed session. One big difference is who attends, and the other is whether data is aggregated by treatment group, and that only occurs in the closed session. So in the open session, discussion items include patient accrual, compliance with the protocol, and problems encountered. Well, in the closed session, unblinded safety and efficacy data is reviewed, confidentiality of data is emphasized, and then the advice to start, stop, or modify the trial protocol is made. Sometimes the event rate is only known in the closed session, and that is important, as mentioned previously in some of the stroke studies, the event rate is lower than expected, and that can um, change the level of risk to participants in the trial. So the flow of, um, this is the flow of the meeting. Usually the first meeting uh, has all four sessions. So in the closed session, it's the DSMB members and the NIMDS liaison. We're in the open session, everyone participates. The second closed session, and is then the DSMB members, the liaison, in addition of the study statistician, and then everybody returns for the recommendations. So the procedure in the next slide is that the first meeting, basically the protocol is discussed at length. And the study does not start until this happens. And um, pre-specified guidelines that Catherine mentioned are mentioned here, so they're established before the study starts. And therefore, after that, there are biannual meetings that can be by conference call or face-to-face. -face. The face-to-face -face meetings are more effective, and generally they occur about once a year. To give you accumulating safety data and also necessary empirical analysis is um, conducted. In addition to this, an emergency meeting can be called either by the DSMB or NIMDS at any time, and this has happened. And uh, it's a very, very important um, situation. <laughs> so ideally the DSMB does not mon uh, modify protocol, they actually just keep it and try to protect participants. Although in some circumstances we've had to um, modify the protocol. But in summary, the DSMB is put into place in order to protect human subjects, to avoid risks and to ensure that the unavoidable risks that subjects take on result in the absolute highest quality of treatment, safety, and efficacy. Roger's going to give a couple of examples of case studies. He's been very quiet so far, so I look forward to hearing what he has Thank you, Rob. I was quiet because I was trying to look ahead to figure out when I should switch, and I just found out that. That is not something I'm very good at. That's what we're doing. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is, uh, by the way, these are my financial disclosures, which I always show. Um, and thank you to NIMBS uh, for supporting the course. Um, I don't think any of them are directly related to this. So what I'm going to do is, is go through some examples that I wasn't personally involved in but that are directly applicable to the kind of work that we're doing. And I am shamelessly stealing from the author, Robin A. Conwit et al. Um, and I think we have posted this. Uh, so you can see a little irony here, right? Um, so we'll just move on. So I try to put this cartoon in every talk I give um, and make a different comment about it each time. Poor Will has heard most of the different comments. Um, I sometimes do the Rorschach question where I ask people what they think it means. I get a variety of, of uh, responses. In this talk, what it means is, is to remind you that the goal here is to hurt as few people as possible while you learn things. You're never going to avoid hurting everybody, but you want to just keep the body count down. Okay. <laughs> so, <coughs> well, is there a problem? <laughs> That's also our specialties mantra. Okay. Okay. So the first example, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through a number of examples that illustrate the kinds of decisions DSMBs make. And these are sort of the classic decisions that are made. And the comment that um, Catherine made about 
Um, serving on a DSMB, if you are ever asked, is great advice. The amount you can learn about what goes well and what goes badly in clinical trials from being the unblinded person who sees it as it, as it uh, unravels or occurs, depending on the campus, just it's priceless. It's, it's analogous, I digress for just a second, Sorry, Will. Um, it's analogous to this fact that if you ever get asked to be on a grant review panel of any sort, the answer should be yes unless you're in the hospital or have a family obligation because uh, the amount you learn about good grantsmanship by seeing what other people do well and do badly is, is invaluable. So same thing with the SMB. So this is an example from back in 1991. And what's interesting to me as we go through these is look, as ha look at how the results were reported versus what actually happened. So in this case, we, the study was an investigation that determined whether carotid end arterectomy, which had become very commonly used and then became less commonly used, reduced the risk of stroke among patients who had a recent uh, stroke and had uh, same side stenosis. And they had two different strata of patients based on the degree of stenosis in the carotid artery. And this is, an, this is a report of the subset that had higher grade stenotic lesions of 79.9%. And what they do is, is in this abstract, they say, we report here the results of in 659 patients uh, who had an, an ischemic attack or non disabling stroke 128 days in this high grade stenosis. All patients got either the carotid uh, end arterectomy or optimal medical therapy um, with carotid end arterectomy. And the results are, are reported this way. Life table estimates of the cumulative risk of any ipsilateral stroke at two years were 26% if you got meds alone and 9% if you got surgery plus meds for an absolute risk reduction of 17%, so a number needed to treat just a tad over five. Um, it was highly statistically significant, and they reported that this was really a good thing to do in this population, and there was a, a, a public release of, of, of this uh, information. Do you see anything about data monitoring in here? Anything that suggests to you this was not the planned actual protocol? Not at all. This is actually something that drives me crazy when I review articles. Okay. So what actually happened? Well, the trial was originally powered to detect a 50% reduction uh, in stroke in patients with a high-grade stenosis. And to achieve that, they expected to have to enroll 600 patients and follow them for five years. They had an, a stopping rule, which I don't think was on Catherine's list, which is if you get a p-value less than 0.001, don't do anything. Wait for six months. Look again and make sure it was still less than 0.01. And if you made this qualitative judgment that it was also unambiguous and clinically important, it's a little difficult for me to see how you would fail that test if you met this p-value criteria, then you recommend stopping. This is an explicit um, license for the DSMB to do all kinds of crazy random decision making. I would not allow this to be in a charter if, I, if it were me. Okay. Um, but they also had a futility rule, so that's a good thing. So they also had a futility rule. And what actually happened is when they had about one and a half years of follow-up, they had over-enrolled a little bit, they recommended stopping because they met these criteria. So this is the relatively rare example of early stopping for overwhelming evidence of benefit that was likely a true positive. We believe it to be a true positive. This is a rare event. Most of what you read about in group sequential clinical trials and monitoring spend a whole bunch of time talking about when to stop early, and there's editorials about the problems associated with this. It almost never happens, and what we really should be figuring out is how better to know when to stop for futility or harm, because unfortunately that is more common. Okay. Here's another example uh, in which one of your presenters is the first author. So this was a uh, randomized placebo-controlled trial of topiramate in ALS. And the objective was to determine if long-term topiramate therapy was safe and slowed disease progression. Disease progression was uh, measured as their pre-specified primary endpoint as the rate of, uh, in, of I have to get this right, rate of change in upper extremity motor function as uh, monitored in, in a standardized way. And patients were randomized two to one to the uh, active therapy. 
What they found in the way it was reported was that the patients treated with topiramate showed a faster decrease in arm strength, clearly not what it was hoped for, during the 12 months, and that this was statistically significant at 0.012. And then it goes on to say that, of course, based on this, treatment at this dose in this population is not warranted. Again, and this is um, a relatively older study, at least it's 10 years old, and I think there has been a gradual change in the style of reporting of early stopping or, or at least uh, decisions by DSMDs. But again, you don't see anything in, in the abstract that tells you the whole story, although it's clearly reported elsewhere. What actually happened was the trial had a randomized phase where you're learning about the um, efficacy of topiramate, and then it had a planned open label extension. I have that right, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm looking at the PI here. Um, See, this is awkward. I'm stealing stuff from her article and I'm looking at the PI, so. Uh, uh, so at the end of the randomized component, the DSMB looks at the randomized comparison and sees that there's evidence of harm or certainly no evidence of benefit with the active treatment. So what they recommend is that there's an immediate termination of the open label phase because the open label phase is sort of predicated on the assumption that being on the drug is a good thing. They also noted an excess number of cases of thromboembolism with 12 cases which represented 6% in the active treatment arm and only one case that represented 1%. Remember, there was 2 to 1 randomization. That was almost nominally statistically significant, but I'm sure this wasn't some sort of pre-planned analysis. Interestingly, from my point of view, the, the faster decline in strength, the primary endpoint didn't drive early termination. And I don't know the details of the study. I'd be interested in looking back at the interim monitoring plan and knowing if there was a pre-specified futility analysis, because there was not. OK. In my opinion, using 2020 hindsight um, and not having spent any sweat and blood trying to put this together, I think there should have been a future. <laughs> so I can't lose, but I won't make friends. Um, uh, it seems this is a good example of the value, this is sort of an anticipated regret in the trial design, that if there had been a pre-specified futility analysis, I suspect that it would have been possible earlier in the trial, before the completion of the randomized phase, to know, not know whether topiramide was harmful, but to know that it was not, there was no realistic chance of demonstrating the benefit that would be clinically uh, meaningful. You can stop me at any point if you want. Questions? Okay. Um, here's an example uh, that illustrates both DSMB activities and the perils of subgroup analysis. So there's, there's several, um, uh, it's kind of like a morality play. There's a number of lessons here. Okay. So this is a study comparing uh, to, to clopidine, I don't even say it properly, um, to aspirin. In the, in the prevention, uh, 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 well, on the risk of stroke or death in patients who had a recent uh, transient or mild persistent focal cerebral ischemia. And it was a study lasting for two to six years. So when they result, notice back here, New England Journal 89, it's not really a structured abstract, which has me completely confused. Um, so the three-year event rate for non-fatal stroke or death from any cause was 17% in the active treatment arm, or in the active in the experimental arm, and 19% for aspirin. So first thing, I, when I subtract 17 from 19, I get two. <laughs> okay, so that seems like a very small number because it goes on one hand. So they report it as a 12% risk reduction. It's relative, and they give a 95% confidence interval. Now. I don't know about you, this looks to me like it crosses zero. <laughs> Call me crazy. This would suggest that it's a not a statistically significant thing, but luckily if you instead don't use a confidence interval, but decide to go with the Kaplan-Meier uh, analysis, so you get the time to event, just not the absolute rate, you just barely gets over 0.05. I would love to know how pre-specified this analysis was. Because back in 89, if you looked at statistical analysis plans, 
Many of them were written in a way that were like, we're going to do this, 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 and this. And it was very unclear that there was a single, unambiguous, pre-specified primary analysis. And this looks like endpoint analysis shopping to me. Okay? Wasn't there an... Is there anybody in the room who's on this that I'm now insulting? Not, not yet. I will be here tonight. Okay. okay. So, my, um, so my timing is good, which is unusual. It'll be, on, it'll, be on, it'll be on YouTube in a couple weeks. Okay. So keep that in mind when you think about, and obviously I have the benefit of 2020 hindsight here. Keep that in mind for what happens next. So now we do a subgroup analysis. Does anybody know if this subgroup analysis was pre-specified in the original protocol? Sure. I'm sorry? That's enough. I'm pretty sure it was. Okay. So I, I would bet, actually I would bet someone about five to one that it wasn't. Okay? So they go back and they look at this. Remember, you have this barely statistically significant result that may not have been in a pre-specified analysis. So now you do an unplanned subgroup analysis, not giving the investigators the benefit of the doubt, and you compare white and non-white subjects. And what they find is that the one-year cumulative event rate per 100 patients for stroke or death from the cause was 5.5 for uh, hypopidine and 10.6 for aspirin, an apparent 48.1% reduction. Okay? And what they find is that it's a larger reduction um, in the non-white patients. Okay? Let's see if I can find this here. Um, so then there's some language that says, this is about the same effect size which we previously found, and then they quote the same p-value from the original article. I absolutely do not understand this because I thought 19 versus 17 was a 2% difference, or 12% relative, and this looks a lot more like a factor of two to me. So I, I just don't, does anybody have insight into this? How they're arguing that this is the same order of magnitude as what was previously seen. Yeah, okay. It's going in the same direction. Going in the same direction. Okay. So now what happens? So, by the way, physicians are incredibly susceptible to the following behavior. I barely got something significant, or maybe I don't, maybe I know I had to fish around to get that first publication. I'm going to do a subgroup analysis. I'm going to pick the subgroup that looks the best, and now... I'm going to, I believe it's real, so I'm going to prove it in an independent trial. Okay. So here's the independent trial, published in JAMA in 2003. So what they've done is gone back and compared the efficacy and safety of aspirin and, and cyclopidine in the same doses, but now just in the African-American patient. But this is a new independent data set. The blinded phase of the study was halted after 6.5 years when futility analysis received a less than 1% probability of typopidine being superior to aspirin. Okay? The hazard ratio was actually 1.22 for a higher risk of stroke in the patients on the active treatment arm. So now we have a shift in direction. Okay? So one thing to point out is notice how now the report, 10 years later, actually tells you something about the early stopping process, which is a change in pattern of clinical trials reporting. So what happened here was the, uh, this protocol included planned futility analyses, a good thing, and after about 80% of the planned number of events, they had a 1% chance that the study would be superior based on the original thing. That's the conditional probability that Catherine was talking about for the stopping rule. Okay? But you made a comment, Heather, about it being if it's less than 50%. Well, if we stopped at 50%, we would never do any trials, right? We'd be futile right at the beginning because less than 50% of trials were successful. So I would argue for a lower boundary. 1% is very conservative. That's the, I'm going to kick that dead horse till it smells. Okay? Um, and, and the reason people pick levels that are that low is because they can't bear themselves to think their trial might fail and they are just plain irrational, okay? So 50%, we'd never start. 
1%, we almost never stop, but they actually managed to get to a point where you cross 1%, so they essentially proved that it not only didn't work, but it was probably harmful, because there was about a 50% chance that aspirin would have been shown not just to have a point estimate in the better side, but to be statistically significantly better at the end of the trial. And luckily, because uh, the experimental arm had a higher side effect profile and some adverse events and, and was more expensive, they knew it didn't, didn't make sense to prove this more expensive drug with, or with worse side effects was, was actively worse, and so they stopped with fertility. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions or comments for that? Okay. As you can tell from my um, uh, disrespectful flippant attitude, the, it's really useful to do DSMB work in an area that you actually are not emotionally invested in because you will start to see patterns that you then recognize within your own field, like unplanned subgroup analyses, overly conservative futility rules, or none at all, which is saying zero is your level. Okay. So what are the general take-home points? Number one, you never know as much going into a clinical trial about what's likely to happen as you think you know. And the more of a specialist you are, the more you are fooled by your own expertise. Okay? Um, this is a quote. I, there's a faculty member at my institution um, uh, who really upsets a lot of people because he's right so often at their expense. Um, and this is the thing he starts out in sort of every talk and then has example after example of people writing editorials about what's going to happen or we don't even need to do this trial, it's so clear we should do this, and then having the results going exactly the opposite direction. So the DSMBs, as Robin started with, um, really need to look at efficacy and safety and futility. Efficacy is every once in a while something is an absolute slam dunk winner and we shouldn't randomize, we should stop and dis disseminate. Safety because you often know much less about safety profiles going into a trial than you think you do because the databases are relatively small, especially in phase two work. And futility so we don't continue to spend resources and expose patients to risk of participation and inconvenience when there's no meaningful chance of either benefit or improving therapies for future patients. They also need to look very closely at the fidelity um, and the continued appropriateness of the original trial design. So the fidelity thing is very important. A huge amount of DSMB time should be spent on making sure the trial is um, conducted exactly as it was intended. And to be honest with you, I think this is more of a challenge in academic settings than it is in the industry because the industry knows the FDA will look at trial fidelity. And the appropriateness of the original trial design, the Women's Health Initiative is a good example. There are cases where you design the right trial and then other information comes along that suggests to you that the trial is no longer either the appropriate trial or an appropriate trial to run. So doing so helps to minimize the risk to the human subjects and it ensures the resources devoted to clinical trials are well spent. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions. <coughs> if Will says that's okay. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I was wondering if you could comment on how you select DSMBs and how that differs depending on which phase, phase one, two, and three, how many people and who you recommend. So as a, as a general rule, um, DSMBs are required or highly advisable in late phase two and all phase three work. There are some cases um, in which it's good to have them even in earlier phase two work as well. As a general rule, and there are some exceptions, phase one work is, is overseen by an individual medical monitor as opposed to a DSMB. The rationale, as best I can tell, is that even though the medical monitor is frequently an employee of the company or the sponsor, at that point, the drug is so far from market that they know most of them are going to fail, and, and the, the, the incentives to avoid early termination seem to be lower there, so the risks seem to be lower. Okay. In terms of um, uh, membership, there's a funny rule, which is it should always be an odd number, so the group can never be deadlocked in a vote. And then the, uh, the uh, qualifications of the members, uh, Robbins says, uh, went over, but biostatistical expertise, clinical domain expertise, preclinical uh, science expertise as appropriate, ethical expertise depending on the risk level of the study, the ability to do fully informed um, consent, patient advocates, um, 
that's generally um, the, most of them in some particular cases. Sometimes you get somebody, so for example, in a cardiovascular trial is looking at stroke in which the drug may affect other things like um, incidence of heart failure. You may actually add a cardiologist. Um, the most important, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so a DSMB that works well works as a team in which there's a diversity of opinion and everybody's opinions get well represented and the, the debate is largely driven by the information that is accumulated. That means the members have to have interest, time, intellectual integrity, and, and not be so sure of what they know that they can't be convinced by new information. So the thing I try to avoid are clinical thought leaders. Okay? The clinical thought leaders are so used to standing up and talking in the tone of voice I'm using right now and expecting that everybody will believe what they say and how dare you contradict me because I'm Dr. Okay? So when I have had trouble with DSMBs, it is because of clinical thought leaders, people who thought they knew what the answer was already, if only the data would just cooperate, um, and, and occasionally statisticians who have such a narrow um, thought paradigm for clinical trials that they have trouble reacting when the data don't fit something. Let me give you an example. It's a trial, two-part trial, there's a sample size re-estimation, the trial design completely pre-specified says, we take the data from part one, we run these complicated models, we take this p-value, and this, this goes to, is plugged into a formula that gives us the new sample size. What do you do when the models don't converge? Do you just stop and throw up your hands? Okay, you gotta do something. And in those cases, you need people who have tremendous expertise and a certain amount of intellectual flexibility and able to shift and pivot, if you will. Okay. So what I wanted to add, in case you're thinking about this in a very practical way, is that we do like to have new people and junior people on the DSMB. So if you're interested in giving their names, because we keep a list of people who are interested in participating in the DSMBs. The key is that you're independent from the study. So for example, the SHINE trial, here from UVA, and the Medical University of South Carolina is the statistical center. So those two centers would be out of balance for the membership. But you know, almost anyone else, potentially, if you need Yes. So I would add that if you have clinical sites at other shops that you don't want to have a clinical DSMB member, because those sites end up being right. out of bounds as well. Right, so all the hubs and spokes of net, for example, would be out of bounds, at least the hubs. And uh, yeah, so but we have this long algorithm, and that's why the more names the better. But we're really open to new numbers and training. And it's essentially the same conflict of interest rules that apply to grant review. So if you, your colleagues, your institution get money in some way related to the trial, then, then you're out of bounds. But, but that, that's also, I mean, that's one of the challenges of DSMBs, a lot for the longer trials, is that, let's say like the NIH trials, is that if, it, if a trial is one for five or you know, some studies that go beyond five years, is people move, right? Either people move or somebody who's in the trial might move to your institution and conflicts of interest change. And, I mean, one of the challenges for DSMBs, and maybe you can address this, Rogers, when, when the structure of the DSMB has to change because of a new conflict, you lose the history and kind of the, the collegiality. And it's hard both, I mean, it's hard to come in as a new person on a DSMB without the background of what has been discussed or what has gone. And it's hard for the DSMB to have someone replaced who doesn't have that background, where, yeah. where you lose kind of the, you know, this is where we've got, this is all the discussions in the past. I mean, reading minutes or reading summaries is not the same as, as being in the room. So like DSMBs that stay together through the life of the study tend, at least in my experience, function better than DSMBs when you have to replace two people at some point during the study. Let me just say something real quick. You know, we've had people unfortunately pass away that were on the DSMB, including the chair in a couple cases. And so um, we've had to replace them and it's been okay. But you're right, it's better to have a continuity. So we are looking for young, healthy people. <laughs>
So the other comment about confidentiality and integrity, it is really <coughs> important that people understand, I mean, this is like being on a jury or, I mean, I can't really think of, you know, avoiding insider trading kinds of things. Um, you know, for example, I was the chair of the DSME for the process study, which is a big sepsis study. It went over a long time, much longer than they anticipated. And so I had the experience of having seen interim data, which is now completely public, that showed there was no difference between the arms, including the more invasive and the less invasive, and then going to work in a department and having to say that based on the public information, we should be doing invasive things to patients that I had separate information knowing that it probably wasn't benefiting those patients. So it, it can put you in a very uh, challenging position. And there was another question back. Uh, okay. Can you comment on, uh, on the SMDs and industry sponsor trials and sort of what the standard is for the various uh, companies to supply and object to the SMD? Sure, sure. So the, the DSMB is advisory to the sponsor. The sponsor can be an INDS, the sponsor can be industry. Because um, DSMBs are usually used in late phase development in industry, the uh, industrial partners know that the membership and the potential conflicts of interest will be closely scrutinized by the FDA. So as a general rule, there is a very strong incentive to do the right thing even if you don't believe anybody in industry ever does the right thing for the right reasons, it's because they have to. I chair, I, I don't know, I'm probably chairing something like six or eight DSMBs right now. And I can tell you that I do some in industry, I do some in, uh, in, in age sponsored studies. And the, uh, the quality of the membership is equivalent and um, the my experience with the industrial partners of the for-profit setting following the advice of the SMBs is very, very good. So even though DSMBs are advisory, nobody in their right mind would ever not do what a DSMB suggested that they do. And industry is, actually has their hands tied because the DSMB has access, access to unblinded data. So the industry has to decide, the industrial partner, the, the drug company or device company, has to make a decision whether to unblind themselves before they can know whether they agree with your decision. Once they unblind themselves, the trial is dead, right? It's no longer a regulatorily valid trial. And so they have got to trust you. So the thing that I tell people in either academics or in for-profit settings is, you wanna make absolutely sure that your DSMB as a group will, will show good judgment that when you ultimately get to have 2020 hindsight and look at their decision, you feel confident that you'll say, may not be the outcome I wanted, but I agree with the decision making process. So I've had uniformly good experiences. Um, I, based on swell, okay, I've had pretty good experiences and based on some experiences, I now insist on personally approving each member to avoid the clinical thought leader thing. Okay. There was a question there. I just want to clarify, so if, one, if you sit on an A's and B, your institution cannot participate in that, in that trial, correct? Yeah, or vice versa. If the institution is participating in the trial, which is often harder to come by, we have to find it in the DSMB member. Gotcha. So usually those are the DSMB members, members are cheap compared to good clinical <laughs> trial sites. So I guess uh, I was curious, from a, from a practical standpoint, as, a, as sort of a young faculty, um, how uh, your boss sees Faculty for speaking at DSMB if it then if it's not for speaking at trial. Depends on the wisdom of your boss. Here, there's a boss. That's national reputation. So most institutions, depending on what track you're on, if you're invited to be on a DSMB or ad hoc on a study section for the NIH, that is a really good thing. I agree with Roger. Unless you're in the hospital, you should be accepting those opportunities. You're going to learn a ton, but it's also national reputation that your chair can argue. Is demonstrating that you're you're um, developing a national reputation for promotion. So, yeah, and and just, just to, so I, I don't mean in any way to, to say anything less supportive about participating in multi center trials, but being a site PI at a local institution in a big clinical trials network is is actually a lower academic stature than being on a national committee overseeing that trial. Okay. But, but I mean, Chris. I mean, just to make it maybe really specific to you, you're the you're at the clinical 
Coordinating Center for Stroke Connect, where all large scale stroke trials are going to go, and the site for the Neurologic Emergency Treatment Trials Network, where much emergency neurologic trials and neurocritical care trials will go. So you can put yourself on the list, but. <laughs> 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 not a right size, you have to match it to the risk profile of the study and the and the disease setting, right? So I've been in some where I need a neurologist, I need an ID person, I need a cardiologist because all three, I don't know which of those expertises are going to be important, but all three might and they need to be there from the beginning for the reasons that Chris is coming with. So I've, I've been in some that are, I, 11 sounds really large to me, okay? Um, I share some that are three, because it's the smallest odd number that doesn't seem like a single person. And, um, and those are for low risk things or things where it's relatively simple. Um, I'm doing one where the drug is approved in Europe and it's been given to you know, 100,000 people who kind of know the risk profile. Um, so I think, I think you match it. I will comment that you can almost always create a diversion for the committee by having more than one statistician because at some point they will be bickering about something. Um, uh, and, and the same is true of two, of two clinical experts in the same area. So I generally try to, all kidding aside, I generally try to avoid having two people with equivalent expertise or similar expertise so I don't double that up. Um, and I have occasionally been in a situation where I inherit a membership of a DSMB and then I add members to counterbalance certain issues, and so I have to do strategic additions. Okay, um, so sometimes I've ended up with big committees that way. But as a general rule, five-ish feels about right for most things, and then more if I'm adding an ethicist or a patient advocate, or I have to have a basic scientist. Right, I mean, three just seems... Three seems small. awfully small. But three is Three is common because it's the smallest odd number. I will say though, it's a big time commitment, and at least for an and yes, you're not all paid. So, but I agree that you should take it on. But it, that's why sometimes it's hard for us to get five or seven. Right. Well, it, but it isn't. It isn't. I mean, that's kind of the dirty little secret of DSMB. Like, if you happen to get on a DSMB of a study that has no unexpected issues or nothing unusual happens, which does happen from time to time, and it's rare, but it does. Being on a DSMB is really not that. Work. I mean, you're seeing a report, you're reviewing the report, you're meeting and you're Sounds discussing. Yeah, it's exactly. when you're on the study where you thought this was going to happen and this is happening, then it becomes a part time job where right. you spend a lot of time and you really don't know going in. So it's kind of your, you know, your, your expected time working on a DSB average across all DSBs is not that much, but the variability in the amount of time you have is very different and totally different. And, and maybe it's obvious, but the ones where something really weird happens and you have a whole bunch of unscheduled calls, those are the real, those are the ones you really learn from. And so, 
I, I know it, the reason we're on DSMVs is not because I think we don't get $200 a, a meeting or something, and I am yes, which I, I, I dutifully report. Um, uh, but that's not why you do it. You do it because you really know something. Um, you learn something about clinical trials practice and sometimes about them in the area of medicine because the people in the other fields that you interact with are likely to be really smart, thoughtful people because they've been handpicked. And so you get to interact with smart people in other fields. And it, it, it's really, I mean, obviously I love it, but I think it's a great thing. All right, um, we're so, so we're done. Um, the next small group session, which also has some times for individual meetings, um, is, was scheduled to run from 10.15 to um, quote unquote 11.15, but we'll have it run from 10.30 to 11.30 because that's when we'll be doing the next talk. Um, so we'll, we'll phase shift all of those small group meetings and um, everything to start at 10.30, and then individual meetings with faculty members, we'll cross out the times and have them run from 10.30 to 